So we have just started to sort of open uh, this text on uh, the teachings of mindfulness, the Buddha's 10th, uh, what is often called sermon, although that's, uh, it's more of a Dharma talk really, uh, on the teaching of mindfulness, and that mindfulness itself is all we need for the realization of a state called nirvana. This is right at the beginning of the sutra, and so although we may see mindfulness uh, in terms of stress reduction and relieving of anxiety, and there's mindfulness for cognitive therapy called MBCT, there's mindfulness for uh, recovery, and it's, it's applied to what we might call all of these secular uh, kinds of fields. Mindfulness at its roots is a transformative practice. It is a practice, according to the Buddha, um, that leads to what we can call awakening or uh, liberation. And so without kind of quickly skipping over that very important presupposition that mindfulness brings us, which is that uh, we have within us this capability that is really quite remarkable and also very subtle. And so this teaching is there to awaken in us, to reveal rather these qualities of deep, deep joy and well-being and clarity and spaciousness and creativity and wisdom and love, there really is all we need in this life, that we can find whatever we may be looking for out in the world to satisfy that need on the external or maybe in terms of um, sort of stimulus driven pleasures that distract us for a while that internally at the very heart of who we are is this spontaneous wellspring this resource of deep well-being and enlightenment so this is really the this is the presupposition upon which all of the mindfulness practices and teachings are based oh, and ultimately that we carry within us what we can call unborn uh, an unborn freedom. We carry at the heart of who we are uh, really an unlimited potential as human beings. And so even if we don't resonate with the language of enlightenment, freedom, awakening, liberation, and so on, what it says about our potential and what it says that we have within us a resilience, if you will, that is self-evident when everything else is quiet. This text, it's interesting that he tells us that we contemplate these things in regard to the world. And he could just stop and say, look, whatever happens, um, contemplating the body, feelings, mind, and so on, and even insights, and that's, that's good enough. And he's really, he adds this last phrase with regard to the world, in regard to the world. Largely, this, what this is doing is seeking to unhook us from this outward directed mind, the mind that projects out onto everything. Yeah? It also projects inwardly onto ourselves. That is also seen to be outward. That sounds confusing, I know because what is being projected is from a very, very subtle source. And at the heart of the subtlest dimension of our consciousness, awareness itself, there is no projection. There is just sort of a wakeful lucidity of mind. You know, what we might also call suchness. And so basically we're stopping this kind of projector of the mind, if you will, this projector onto all things, including ourselves and all the judgments that we place on self and other, our schemas, largely the things that we cling to, the things we are averse to, the things that cause us anxiety, the things that cause us to avoid or to fall asleep and ultimately doubt everything, including ourselves and the practices. So freedom here is really freedom from all of these processes and allowing and abiding. And to do this, this is these three sort of qualities of mind that we've been looking at. The first one was ardency or diligence. The second, clarity, clearly knowing. 
And here we, are, we are, interestingly arrive in a text on mindfulness is simply to be mindful. <laughs> and it's interesting. He actually uh, singles this out as a quality. Why on earth would he do that? After all, we are, he's teaching us how to be mindful. And that is, that there are different ways of being mindful. Mindfulness, yes, can be a formal practice in the way that he tells us how to do it. Go to the foot of a tree, an empty hut, and so on. Sit, put your legs in Padmasana in the lotus position. You can also sit on a chair. So for some of us, that's not so easy. And contemplate your breathing in, breathing out, being mindful. And then he goes on from there to teach us how to be mindful with respect to body, the first foundation, with respect to feelings, the second foundation, with respect to our mental life, thoughts and such, the third foundation, and ultimately leading us to insights, the, the fourth foundation, which is the beginning of insight practice or vipassana or vipassana. So this is sort of a bit of a review. I remembered that time um, that uh, kind of what is the process at work here that we're looking at. And so we have covered ardency. We have covered clearly knowing. And largely what we're talking about in these first two stages is a term, another term called shamatha. Shamatha. Shamatha is a, uh, it's part of the more formal aspect of cultivating mindfulness. It is the kind of suspending of attention or the return if it wanders onto an object of concentration. And by concentrating gently, without effort, without a whole lot of without any straining or trying, but just an allowing, the mind naturally settles on its own. And a sense of clarity of what we might call clearly knowing arises on its own. That's why these qualities are mutually interdependent. So the first quality of concentrative attention, not sort of letting ourselves drift. And if we do, that's fine. We don't judge. We just bring ourselves back to breath back to body, back to a feeling perhaps, back to a way of holding our thoughts. And so that is that kind of diligence, it's, it's not letting ourselves kind of run away with ourselves, if you will, but retreating ourselves when we do. And then naturally, by sustaining attention in a voluntary, easeful way on an object, the mind eventually settles itself. We don't have to make mindfulness happen. It is uncontrived. Yeah. And as this happens, as clear knowing arises, we can start seeing things with greater vividness, greater acuity, what we can call an acuity of mind or a vividness of awareness. Becoming, things become in, in uh, they come into clarity because we're no longer throwing projections into them. We're just simply receiving them as they are. And that is this third quality of mindful, being mindful, being receptive. And this, this form of mindfulness is not necessarily the formal practice of mindfulness. It is that underlying natural state of awareness. We are then encountering awareness as it is. And so as we consider, you know, maybe we've had classes in mindfulness, maybe you've been to my extension school courses or other classes such as at North Hill, and we've talked about what is mindfulness and such. Um, tonight, what I'm thinking is, is to think about how mindfulness relates to this quality of freedom. So it's not just an end point. Okay, now I'm mindful of body, I'm done. Yeah. But rather, we are made workable, we are malleable now, we are flexible. Because after all, mindfulness is this quality of simply observing without the reactivity. We are just accepting, we are receptive to all of our experiences in the moment. Nothing is missed, nothing is rejected, nothing is grasped, yeah? So by this point in our practice, we have settled ourselves perhaps on a cushion, we have set ourselves up in the formal practice of mindfulness perhaps, where we're sitting, we're meditating. And when we are 
in an effortless state of abiding. This is where the Buddha is telling us to contemplate the body mindful, mindfully with a state of openness and receptivity, a state of wakefulness and presence of mind. After all, what is it that mindfulness, the, the Pali word sati means? Yeah. It means remembering. It means it implies memory. And here, we're not just remembering random thoughts. Maybe we are, but we are actually remembering to be mindful. So mindfulness is remembering to be mindful. <laughs> sati means don't forget that your awareness is holding all of these experiences. Yeah. In this sense, the formal practice helps us get in touch with just a natural state, an underlying state of mind, if you will. So we can think of freedom now as really relying on this state of mindfulness. They're not the same thing. After a freedom, we can what we can see sort of as the early stage of cultivating a sense of freedom from dukkha or suffering and discontentedness freedom from the clinging and the grasping that is also part of suffering because it's all everything is impermanent here sati happens through the four foundations in other words mindfulness is cultivated by contemplating body and breathing and the four elements and through contemplating feelings and through contemplating the nature of our own thoughts recognizing that as thoughts arise at some point they disappear on their own and that disappearing conveys more truth about the nature of that thought than it's arising meaning that the thought itself is impermanent and is largely insubstantial that doesn't mean they're not important to us but they are constantly changing depending on causes and conditions and contexts. So sati, mindfulness happens through the four foundations. And these three mental qualities we're talking about, ardency, um, clearly knowing, and mindfulness itself are the points of practice. These are the things we're remembering in our practice. And they are the determinants of how we experience the foundations. Am I experiencing my body with some diligence of attention, with some clarity and mindfully? Maybe not. Maybe I'm, ha maybe I'm experiencing unpleasantness in the body or some kind of pain or discomfort. That's all good. It's all fine because we are able to simply bear witness to it without being immersed in it. And this is why, um, as I was thinking about what we were going to talk about tonight, this phrase came to me, the agency of non-agency. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. If you know what that means, right offhand, just give me a little wave. Does that make sense to you? Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Nobody's waving. The agency of non-agency. Meaning that we have a sense of agency when we are mindful. We, in other words, we have intention, we have aspiration. The aspiration is that which is for wholesome ends, not for the things of the world, as the Buddha tells us. And yet, the things that are sort of besieging us, distracting us, causing us to get off track, they are not what we identify with. So there's a non-identification is the non-agency. So we are basically um, openly aware. And this is a very subtle form of agency. And yet we are also not identifying so fully with the limitations of uh, worldly thinking and mind and feelings and all of that. We have them, but we're not so fully identifying with them. And so in that way, there is no longer an agency if you consider that who I am is not my thoughts, my feelings, but rather I am this sense of open awareness. So in a way, we can think um, that 
mindfulness here, what the Buddha is trying to teach us, is both an intrinsic quality. It's something that we don't have to try to make happen. And it is something we also cultivate. Both are true. So yes, mindfulness may be a natural state, may be a quality of our natural state of mind, of their underlying awareness, but we can also, through intention, cultivate a deepening of that mindfulness. And the difference is, one is intentional, one is asp what we can say aspirational. We practice because we are seeking something. We are aspiring to feel different, to transform in some way. And one form of mindfulness, so that's, that's sort of the cultivation, the aspirational part. The other is that mindfulness is simply self-evident. We know it when we feel it. So what we're talking about here is fullness. Uh, this will be my last point. The sense of fullness. And in this fullness, there is a subtlety, a subtlety of awareness that is the source of freedom itself. So as we've been talking in prior weeks about freedom attending reality, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about sort of a deconstructing of all of this outward directed energy and mental energy and likes and dislikes and subtleties. And we are seeking to uh, relate in a deeper way, in a way that is more sincere with this source of fullness, this presence that is just inherently and intrinsically self-evident. Awareness that is just self-shining. That's another way to say it. Luminous is this mind, brilliantly shining, free of all attachments. The Buddha says, and I think it's the Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, this is self-evident. We don't have to try to make this happen. So ardency helps us with that focus, maintaining the concentrative attention. Clear knowing arises naturally when the mind settles. And out of that comes an experience of effortless observing, which we can call mindful. So when the Buddha is telling us here, contemplate the body mindfully, he's basically saying, allow yourself to abide in your body effortlessly and with full presence. And remember that this is who you are, this effortless presence, more so than all the other stuff that seeks to dominate that sphere, uh, that sphere of awareness, that field of awareness, uh, to clutter it back up again. <laughs>